Please welcome to the stage the chair of the Oregon Business Plan Steering Committee, Pat Wrighton. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? Welcome to the Oregon Leadership Summit. It's great to see you all here today. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be back again with you. We have in the audience today elected business and civic leaders from all over Oregon. Uh, I want to extend a special welcome to the members of the legislature. Uh, last year, we, at this summit, we kicked, you received, and to kind of abuse the metaphor a little bit, you piled up a ton of yardage, and we couldn't be more grateful. So thank you for again being here with us. This is our ninth gathering since 2002 when Senator Wyden's idea of getting public and private sector folks together in this forum came to a reality. For those just joining this process, the Oregon Business Plan has become a unique statewide collaboration of business, elected, and community leaders. Our purpose is to grow Oregon's economy and good jobs in every corner of the state by improving the conditions for business success. The leadership is where we update the Oregon Business Plan. Each year, throughout the year, hundreds of you network, share concerns, analyze problems and opportunities, and propose solutions. Our steering committee gathers these important pieces and gets it all packaged up for discussion. Then you come here to consider and refine concrete ideas for making Oregon economically stronger. So what's happened since last year, since we were all here together? Back then, I stood before you with a problem and a plan. We called the problem Oregon's circle of scarcity. Taking a hard, painful look at the data, we saw that Oregon's incomes had declined over the past decade in relation to the nation and in relation to our neighboring states, both south and north. Together, declining income and recession have stressed families across Oregon. Job losses, home foreclosures, and food insecurity plague far too many Oregonians. Falling incomes also hammered public budgets and services. Compounding that, we've also seen expenditures grow for Medicaid and corrections. This siphons off money that would otherwise go to education, especially higher education. Since education is the key to securing a quality job, that disinvestment either for, even further erodes opportunity. From this microphone last year, the governor called this a death spiral. Our guest speaker, David Osborne, warned against riding a dead horse. I said that these conditions, under these conditions, Oregon isn't such a special place anymore. And let me tell you, I mean, there, there was blowback from that message, and some of it uh, lit up the Pacific Core switchboard. We had, to, we had to give talking points to our call center agents on that one uh, to emphasize that we were talking about the economy and not, not the place. But at least we know that the message was heard. Hard assessment isn't always welcome, but it's useful. We knew we needed a way to steer Oregon out of this impasse, so we refocused the Oregon business plan on two things, a stronger jobs agenda and a way to redesign public services so that we can get more value from our tax dollars and maintain our investment in education. Thankfully, as we gather this year, there's reason to feel better about things. Uh, there's still too much unemployment and pain out there, very clearly, uh, but we see signs of economic improvement. The biggest difference is how much traction we've seen on the recommendations we made last year. The governor and legislature passed dozens of measures to support these recommendations. On the government redesign side, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to transform our education system, change the way we purchase health care, and overhaul state budgeting connected to those and other public, uh, important public services. On the job side, uh, we've renewed support for our innovation agenda and new tools for business development, and stakeholder groups and public officials at all levels are working together in making headway on opportunities in regulatory improvement, industrial land supply, forest health, and in infrastructure. These are real breakthroughs. 
They call for a lot of follow-up implementation work in 2012 and beyond. Hence, our theme this year, time to deliver. Before touching on the work uh, ahead, let's, let's briefly review how we got here. Our work grows out of the Oregon Business Plan framework. This states our goal and vision, maps our strategy, identifies specific initiatives to execute that strategy and achieve our goal. The Oregon Business, goal, Oregon business Plan goal is to create quality jobs in every corner of the state. Last year, we set down two benchmarks for economic improvement. First, create 25,000 additional jobs per year statewide throughout this decade. By the end of the decade, raise our per capita income above the national average. And we're almost 10% below that now, so our challenge there is serious. So how are we doing? We won't know for a while on the per capita income goal, but we have mostly good news on the jobs indicator. The data show that we're on schedule to meet the annual jobs target. Since October 2009 to this past October, the private sector has added nearly 30,000 payroll jobs throughout the business sector. That's somewhat offset by the public sector job losses. With budget reserves almost dry and the federal stimulus funding over, we've lost about 5,000 jobs over the last year mostly at the local level. That includes teachers, police, other public servants. That picture should improve, however, as the private economy grows, so will revenue available for public services. Against the backdrop of still high, employ high unemployment, what are the signs of recovery? On this score, the news is also encouraging, but mixed. Even though the housing slump continues, which hits everyone connected to home building, there are some real positives. The sky is full of cranes in Hillsboro, where Intel is building its newest leading edge fab. That represents a $6 billion investment, 8,000 construction jobs, and 1,000 new manufacturing jobs when the, when the fab opens. Venture funding seems to be in the business news weekly especially with software and high-tech firms. A good example of that is Folium Partners in Ashland. Uh, they're a software specialist in mobile apps, and they've grown to 18 people. Folium, Fol Folium was the first recipient of a $300,000 investment at the Southern Oregon Angel Investment Conference this past year. Another good uh, example, a good story, is Riverhawks Boat in Medford which makes a range of watercraft for outdoor enthusiasts. Uh, they're expanding into a new, larger facility, adding 70 new jobs. And there are more examples, some we hope to hear about today and tomorrow that are providing signs of life. A major focus of the Oregon Business Plan's vision for the economy is to encourage and support what we call the traded sector. Firms and groups of firms that compete in national and global markets these are global leaders in product innovation and market reach. They bring in fresh dollars that drive the rest of the economy. We're awfully lucky to have a lot of them, and they're highly productive. They make us a top-tier state, both in manufacturing jobs and in manufactured products per capita. For example, our exports per capita are 11% above the U.S. average. From 1997, to 2010, Oregon's real GDP per capita rose from 86% to 103% of the national average. Most of that came from productivity growth in our traded sector firms. Exports represent one-fifth of Portland area economic activity, which ranked it second nationally. For example, the Silicon Forest export is, exports as many computers and electronics to China as does the Silicon Valley. In short, Oregon is very good at making things, especially high-value products. You're going you're to hear today from a wide range of industry clusters, and I think you'll be inspired with what they have to say. From speakers to special, from sneakers to specialty agriculture, from computer chips to doors and windows, Oregon's companies and industries are demonstrating global leadership. And by the way, they make some pretty cool products. So I brought a couple with me. So I, I 
Don't have to introduce uh, what that is. That is a Pacific Power logoed multi-tool made by Leatherman. If you run into my friend, uh, the CEO of Leatherman, Jake Nickel, do not call this a knife. It's a multi-tool. They distribute uh, their products to more than 100 countries and compete on innovation, quality, and integrity. Its 25-year warranty literally shouts out commitment to quality. Schmidt Industries. They, uh, their test and measurement products are designed and built here and shipped globally for use in manufacturing. If I have it, this is an industrial laser module with an 8-inch range. And this, boy, I better not drop this. I'll be in real, uh, real trouble. I understand these are being shipped out to, to uh, customers tomorrow. Uh, this is a control panel for a, a vibration analyzer and balancer for industrial machinery. SAPA profiles, designs, let me get that said, designs in uh, fabricate specialty me metals. They ship, take a look at this, they ship a thousand extruded fan rings per week shipped to Japan and China. My understanding is that this goes at a Volvo. And probably not uh, any of the Volvos you drove here today. Those, are, those would be Volvo trucks. Leupold and Stevens, you want to see a cool product? Take a look at that. Very cool. They're located in Beaverton. They manufacture optics for hunting and shooting, plus binoculars and golf range finders. So this is a VXR rifle scope, it has a fiber optic LED illumination system, so very, very high-tech and precise. That's a 104-year-old company that sells throughout the U.S. and Europe and warranties its products for life. So these are, and again, I'm going to be very, very careful with that, these are just a few examples that remind us of our strength in the traded sector and manufacturing. In the breakout sessions this afternoon, you can choose from a variety of, variety of industry panels to learn what opportunities and challenges cluster our, uh, what opportunities and challenges our clusters face and where they're seeing success and what, uh, what we can do to build on that success. So this leads us to the third element of the Oregon business plan, what we call the four P's for prosperity. People, place, productivity, and pioneering innovation. We had to work hard to get that last, uh, last P together. These are factors in a community that support the kind of productive, high-value companies that we want to keep and attract. We have consistently listened to leaders all across the state uh, with regard to the condition of the four Ps, in particular, what's holding Oregon back. The problems and opportunities that they identify shape the specific initiatives that we adopt each year in the plan. Input like this shapes our initiatives, which is where the rubber meets the road for the Oregon business plan. Remember, our initiatives since last year have been organized on uh, two fronts, the government redesign agenda and the jobs agenda. The redesign agenda seeks public sector improvements vital to the conditions for business success, in 2010, the business plan recommended six of these. Now, the most important were education, health care, and budget reform. And all of those reforms are connected to each other. The jobs agenda, agenda identified ten target opportunities with both immediate and long-range benefit. The idea here is to accelerate public and private investments and put more Oregonians to work. Smart businesses make investments during downtimes. Oregon, Oregon, Oregonians and the state should do the same. We developed a list of 10. For example, support the Oregon Innovation Plan, improve capital access for businesses, streamline regulation and permitting, manage forests for improved health and biomass production. As I noted earlier, 2011 was a productive year on both agendas. You can see that in the table of contents on page 8 of your policy playbook. It looks like this. And while 2011 was successful, the hardest work is really still ahead. The main challenge we face in 2012 and beyond is to implement the laws, policies, and plans that will grow out of those recommendations. 
The other challenge really is, uh, is not to mess this up. I mean, this, this is a special opportunity. The stars are aligned for doing something great for Oregon. It's truly time to deliver. So we'll start that discussion today with our elected leaders and industry leaders, and we'll get down to the technical work in tomorrow's workshops on education, health care, and state budgeting. The heavy lifting we have to do in 2012 and beyond is laid out in your policy playbook. Part of your work, our work, today and tomorrow is to review and refine what you see there. Coming out of this summit, we'll refine the playbook in time to be ready for the upcoming legislative session. So let's get started. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Oregon Senior Senator Ron Wyden. As I mentioned uh, earlier, this summit was the brainchild of Senator Wyden nearly 10 years ago, and he hasn't missed a single summit. From the beginning, he served as the chair of our leadership council, along with, other, with his Senate colleague, the governor, the state Senate president, and House speakers. Throughout, he stressed the importance of bipartisanship. He's traveled the state with us, listening to community needs, and he's addressed the business plan on topics as wide ranging as nanotechnology, forest health, and many other community specific issues. He's been a wonderful partner. Please welcome Senator Ron Wyden. <laughs> Senator, absolutely. Good to see you. Pat, what a gracious and unquestionably inflationary introduction. And I also want to say a big thanks to Duncan Wise and Bill Thorndike and the others who each year grant me the privilege of being part of this great summit that we launched a decade ago. And also, thanks to all of you for being here. Some of you have been here in the past. For a number of you, this will be the first time. Either way, you are going to see this is the place to be, the place where leaders from every corner of the state come to talk about our top priority, creating more good-paying jobs for our state. Now, the gridlock in Washington, D.C. reminds me of a statement once made by a great political philosopher Lily Tomlin. Ms. Tomlin once said, we try to be cynical, but it is hard to keep up. And cynicism alone isn't going to change much, and I refuse to use my certificate of election to promote it. But you know things are tough when the Germans and the French are getting along better than the Democrats and the Republicans. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do is spend just a few minutes describing how smarter federal policies can start busting up the gridlock for Oregonians. These are policies built around innovation, policies that reinvent old models and tap into new markets to create real change and real jobs. And I'd like to start with the granddaddy of the government safety net programs, the unemployment system. It is a system that too often doesn't work for the unemployed person or for taxpayers. That's because often there are only two choices for those getting unemployment checks either look for jobs that no longer exist or go into training programs that don't fit your skills or your work ethic. I saw things differently. I convinced the United States Congress to allow some of the people to use their unemployment benefits to start a business. While not every unemployed American is a would-be entrepreneur, I believe it makes sense to give a leg up to those who were. And it has worked. Two Oregonians, Adam Lowry and Michael Richardson, took advantage of the law I wrote and used it to start a program, a company, called Urban Airship. Just two years later, Urban Airship has seen a revenue increase of 600%. It is now the darling of the angel investor community, 
attracting millions in strategic investment while becoming a leader in the global market for mobile apps. Scott Caviton is here. He is the president and CEO of Urban Airship. Please now give us a chance to say hello to the face of innovation in Oregon and our country, Scott Caviton, Urban Airship. The success of Urban Airship shows that we're capable of growing inspiring entrepreneurs in our state, and we ought to exploit that by taking advantage of closely related opportunities. So I'm working now with more than 100 business, university, nonprofit, and local leaders because I'd like to see us have a new patent office here in Oregon to promote innovation. Now, this may not sound like much, Another government agency locating, locating yet another government building filled with yet more government workers? What would be the big deal about that? Well, consider what this is really about. Oregon inventors are among the nation's most prolific patent producers, winning more than 2,000 a year. Oregon ranks eighth in the country in terms of per capita patents, and by some calculations, Corvallis is the most innovative city in the United States. Let's have a shout out for Corvallis. With that kind of impressive record and the other considerations we have going for us, it seems to me that this issue is not about what the Patent Office can do for Oregon. It is about what Oregon can do for the country's inventors Yesterday, I talked to the Secretary of Commerce. His agency will be making this decision. He, of course, made no commitments. He'll do it by the book. But let me tell you, Oregon is very much in the running for this patent office, and I'm going to pull out all the stops to bring it home to our community. And while I'm on the subject of conversations with Washington, D.C., I learned yesterday that folks in the aviation community and in Congress have come together on a plan that we believe will lead to a direct flight from Portland to Washington, D.C. There are, there are a number of other issues that have to be resolved in this federal aviation bill, but this is certainly a big step towards improving transportation. Now, let me continue with what Urban Airship is all about and build a bit on their success. They're all about innovation. So we've got to make sure the Congress doesn't do anything to harm the innovative forces in our community and our business sector. And unfortunately, there is a particularly ill-advised effort that would harm innovation because it would allow for the censorship of the internet under the guise of fighting copyright infringement. Under this bill, when we're talking about our Oregon entrepreneurs being two guys in a garage dreaming about being the next urban airship, those two guys in a garage are going to end up with an upstairs level full of lawyers trying to tell them how to operate a website. I'm going to block this legislation in Congress because in a state in a state where we are leaders in terms of open source uh, software for business, we don't need anti-innovation. We need people who unleash the innovation forces in our state. And continuing with Urban Airship, you see another part of the Oregon story, and that is international trade. One out of seven jobs in our state depends on international trade, and whether it is something sent in a box or downloaded from the internet. There are goods like Scots that are finding their way into Europe, they're finding their way into Asia, they're finding their way into a host of markets. This is the Pacific century, and we want to encourage exports and trade with that region. Still, I have a message this morning for the Chinese and our trading partners in the Far East, and that is free trade does not mean trade free from rules. In fact, free trade depends on enforcement of international rules that govern markets 
and when we have free trade and enforcement of the rules, Oregon wins and everybody else does too. Let me give you a little example of what I'm talking about. I had a chance to manage a decent portion of the recent uh, trade legislation, uh, the trade agreements, and I wanted to give you an example of what this means. This is a can of Oregon blueberries, and it comes from Oregon fruit products down in the valley. Because of the Korean Free Trade Agreement, South Koreans who want Oregon blueberries are going to see their prices go down because we will be getting rid of a 45% tariff on this Oregon product. That's what I mean when I'm talking about expanding trade. I want to touch on just several other areas where Oregon innovators can show us again how to lead the way to a stronger economy. A year ago, I was on this stage and I said that the Obama administration rules for biomass were bad science, bad for the future of clean energy, and bad for job creation. And we said we would do everything we could to derail them so companies like John Schultz John Shelk's Ochico Lumber Company and job John Day could grow. With the help of the entire Oregon congressional delegation, those misguided biomass rules have now been kicked to the curb. They are no longer. And as of last week, more sensible rules for industrial boilers are coming as well. And with a bipartisan coalition in the Senate, we're going to block flawed court decisions that would subject our small landowners to mindless litigation seeking to unravel 30 years of federal policy under the Clean Water Act. And soon, and soon the Senate is going to pass a reauthorization of the county payments legislation because this is where God put the trees and the federal government can't turn its back on rural communities. I'm on my watch, that's not going to happen. <laughs> the next stop on the Oregon Trail to more innovation and new jobs is energy storage. And this is particularly important now because the federal regulators have told Bonneville Power that it can't pull the plug on wind farms when the river levels are high. Energy storage is a real solution. To advance it, I've proposed legislation on the Finance Committee on which I serve to jumpstart energy storage because I believe not only can this be a promising industry for Oregon, this is an opportunity for us to lead the nation. We have the land, we have the energy, we have the workforce, and if we can store data for companies like Google and Facebook and apparently Apple, then we can store the energy needed to keep those data centers in operation and bring more of them to our state. And towards that end, I've asked Steve Wright and Bonneville Power to push hard to get these storage technologies attached to their grid and to find new ways to pay for them. Steve Wright is taking energy storage seriously and when you deal with him, those of you that are in, in the energy field, tell him you appreciate his work. I want to close by talking about one last area that is absolutely ripe for Oregon to lead in innovation, and that is federal agriculture policy. We do a lot of things well in our state, but what we do best is we grow things. 250 products generating billions in revenue, $3 billion alone for seed and supplies and other kinds of essentials sold by businesses uh, small and large in urban and rural uh, Oregon. Unfortunately, federal agriculture policy serves up a steady diet of paperwork and red tape and isn't providing the opportunity for our farmers, our hunger advocates, and our taxpayers to come together and produce a better policy. For example, one requirement, which seems odd even by the standards of Washington, D.C. in the Beltway, requires school districts to buy much of their food from a federal warehouse 
rather than Farmer Jones down the road. So I will be introducing this week legislation that doesn't cost taxpayers a dime, but would allow us in the school lunch program and the SNAP program, the food stamp program, to give fo more flexibility for homegrown, locally driven efforts that will create work and jobs on the farm, make it possible for Oregonians to eat healthier and protect the taxpayer's wallet. That's Oregon's contribution to innovation in agriculture. I want to close with a word about uh, you know, partisanship. And I see uh, my friend Alan Alley in the front. And Alan is a Republican. I'm a Democrat. We've worked together often on issues. And I want us to talk for a moment about how we bring people together and bring people together in a polarized you know, political environment. The hurdle that we face is obvious. Elected officials who go outside their political base pay a real price for doing so. The result is, is that now we can hardly tell anymore when the campaign ends and governing actually begins. Now, I happen to believe that political bases can be forces for injecting new ideas into our political process. That's what the Tea Party has done in demanding a curb on federal spending. That's what the Occupy Wall Street movement has done in shining a hot light on the growing income inequality we have. But we go too far when those who seek compromise with the other side are treated as traitors. And I know a little bit about this because I watched the political destruction of former Senator Bob Bennett of Utah one of the most conservative members of the United States Senate who was ousted by his own party because he worked across the aisle to solve big political problems, including the treasonous act of working with me to produce a health reform bill that had seven Democrats and seven Republicans in the United States Senate as co-sponsors. So we face this as we once again go into an election season. And I'd like to offer a couple of steps that help us move towards a solution. First, I hope that all of you will urge political candidates and incumbents not to sign these pledges and instead make one pledge, and that is to serve all the voters and to serve the public interest. And you can follow that up by asking all of the candidates you see to give one example, just one example on a major issue that they will pursue with someone from the other party that helps us build a coalition and get people beyond their political base. With the right answers to those questions, my view is we can break the deadlock in the nation's capital and see that ripple to other government bodies as well. Finally, our economy's going to get better. There's no question about that in my mind. We have an enormous resilience, an enormous bounce back capability. I think we've seen some real progress in manufacturing in recent months. I had a chance to work very closely with Greenbrier to help us start in the right direction. In 2007, they had an order for thousands and thousands of rail cars, and they were faced with the prospect of that agreement being broken, and I led an effort in the Congress to build support for it. They worked it out. And now we're seeing folks, Greenbrier is hiring today. Big headline in the Oregon uh, business publications. They are hiring today. So businesses are hiring, and I want to close with a special request for all of you on the hiring front. I'd like to ask all of you, all of you, not just because it's the holiday season, but because it's the right thing to do, to find a way to hire someone from the National Guard who's just come home after serving us with such valor. We have a lot. We have a lot of these Guard and Reserve members 
who have served two and three tours of duty, they come back and they cannot find a job, folks. And what an incredible workforce. Not going to have any trouble with passing a drug test with those veterans. They know a lot about technology. Incredible uh, discipline. I close today by saying we've got a lot to do in terms of economic growth and creating more jobs in our state. And I want you to know that because the vets have stood up for us, let's take this opportunity to stand up for them, hire a vet, and have a great summit. Thank you. Boy, what a, what a great message that is, for sure.